Thanks, everyone. I know we have many people still joining. This is a great turnout. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Olivia Alford. I'm the director of the Delivery System Reform Team within the Office of Main Care Services. You'll be hearing mostly from other folks today, but I wanted to kick off our meeting with a few um, housekeeping items. One, if you don't mind putting your name and your agency that you work with, or if you are a family member or consumer or general public or legislator, whatever your role might be that brings you here today, if you could put your name and, and that in the chat, it'll allow us to follow up with you if you have any specific questions that we aren't able to cover today or to just know who we're speaking to. So it's always nice to know um, the audience. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, hopefully, you know, we have a large crowd here today. We have two main objectives. The first um, is to have to hear from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and you'll hear from a few people on our team about the, the, the big picture. What is the future direction of mobile crisis response that the department is working on and has been working on with stakeholders over the last few years? And you'll hear more about that model and what goals we seek to achieve with the changes that are being proposed in the new reformed service model. Then we're switch, quickly gonna switch over to a really important part of that discussion, which is gonna be led by Burns and Associates, our, our vendor that's working with us to translate that new care model into a main care reimbursement rate and has structure for how we will pay for these services. So it's always important that we start with what are our goals? How is the service gonna be delivered? What's the best practice? But then we need to, just, you know, we need to put a dollar amount and a methodology behind how are we going to pay for that service. So you'll hear both sides of the conversation today, and we're really at a point here of still um, talking about proposed models, gathering information, looking for solutions. So this is not a day where you'll hear decisions about what the rate's going to be, how we're going to pay. It's part of the process that we're on together to get to those decisions um, in the short term. So with that, I'm going to quickly hand it over to Director Squirrel from our Office of Behavioral Health. Great. Thank you, Olivia. Great to see everyone this afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining. I think Kylie will be sharing some slides with folks, so I can wait for Kylie to tee that up. And while she's doing that, I forgot to add something and um, just for again for housekeeping. You're welcome to put questions in the chat as you as we go along today. And we'll have folks be able to respond to those um, during the presentation or at breaks. And then at the end, um, when we get to the break conversation, there'll be some discussion. And then maybe at the very end of the whole meeting, there'll be some open time for for, feed, for conversation as well. But feel free to use the chat liberally throughout the meeting. Great, thanks, Olivia. Olivia. Uh, thanks, Kylie. Uh, so we can probably move into the next slide, Kylie, but again, just wanna um, echo um, Olivia's opening remarks um, about the importance of this work that we are undertaking. Um, and just to ground us in that, you know, DHHS is really committed to strengthening our behavioral health system in Maine tip to tail. And that's across um, all areas of service delivery. Um, and the main crisis system work um, is particularly urgent and important. Um, we do have a vision and mission for what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, we want our crisis services to be welcoming, hopeful, trauma-informed, recovery-oriented, and serve individuals in the least restrictive settings, uh, really ensuring that individuals have access to the right services at the right time. Um, we also know that payment drives practice. And as Olivia noted, part of the work that we are undertaking is to really deliver and develop a reimbursement model that will support the provision of this service um, today and the service to benefit generations of Mainers to come. I think what I would articulate this is very urgent and important work because we do know that effective crisis systems essentially save lives. Um, and they also require a systemic approach 
um, which is why we have been so thoughtful in engaging our stakeholders and you all as providers as we develop this. So as we think about our work as it relates to crisis work, and I think broadly some of the guiding principles and values regarding our um, approach and practices to behavioral health services in Maine, um, we know that safety is foundational. We know that our crisis services are a key safety net service. Uh, we wanna make sure that these services are available to anyone, anywhere, and any time that they might need them. Um, we recognize that a crisis experience is more than just a single event for an individual um, and that our capacity within our system um, must really support complexity, um, have no wrong door. Um, individuals that might have complex co-occurring needs, uh, for example. And we know that fundamentally one of the most important aspects of our crisis work here in Maine is about relationships and trust. Um, and we know that that access to hope and healing will really allow us to provide the right services to individuals when they need them the most. So we're focusing specifically on mobile crisis uh, today in our discussion, but it's important to remember that DHHS has really been advancing a crisis system continuum of care. Um, this is a SAMHSA best practice, as folks on this call are probably aware. And we really have three pillars of our crisis system continuum. That's someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. Uh, I think we're all very proud of the work that we have done to develop these areas across the system of care. Um, grateful for our partners, the main crisis line, and the work that we have done to implement 988 um, as that uh, someone to call. Uh, we've got some great metrics and data that I'll be sharing in just a moment as it relates to that. In addition, our intentional peer support warm line as well, um, in addition to the NAMI teen text line that we also have available. Um, very germane to the conversation today is our current um, cadre of mobile crisis teams across the state. Uh, we have taken a uh, regionalized approach to that work to ensure that we have access to individuals regardless of where you might live, regardless of what your zip code is. Um, and again, have been uh, quite proud of that work to see how it has unfolded over the past few years. Um, and then the third pillar of our crisis system to continuum of care is somewhere to go. Um, and we have stood up our first uh, crisis receiving center in Cumberland County. I'm very grateful to our partners at Spurwink that have been helping to lead that work. We are just about one year into that implementation and we have seen uh, some great outcomes as it relates to low barrier walk-in access for individuals to receive crisis services to avoid and mitigate any unnecessary involvement with law enforcement to serve those individuals in the least restrictive settings and to connect them to the ongoing care and support that they need. So I do think it's important as somewhat groundwork to this that we also you know, look at some of the current data and outcomes as it relates to our current crisis system continuum, um, just to underscore the breadth of work that is happening uh, still on the heels of the pandemic and we know our workforce um, is still rebounding um, but specifically the main crisis line, um, our partners at the Opportunity Alliance, um, a total in 2022 answered over 100,000 calls. Our answer rate in Maine remains incredibly high at about 94%. Um, post implementation of 988, we've seen an increase in call volume of about 4% and about 84% of those calls are resolved on the phone. Um, so again, just seeing um, the improved access to those critical services. And again, just want to acknowledge the great work of the Opportunity Alliance um, in supporting our main crisis line and the implementation of 988. Uh, we have also have our mobile crisis teams as we were just discussing. Um, and again, uh, very grateful to the work of our teams. Um, we've got really good data as it relates to the number of face-to-face -face contacts in 2022, which was just over 9,000. 83% um, of individuals were seen within two hours, and just under 80% of the dispositions were crisis stabilization with provider referral. So again, thus indicating that access to these mobile crisis services are so critical, we're mitigating against law enforcement, and most individuals are able to receive the stabilizing services that they need and then be referred to other services for ongoing care. Um, 
And then I'm sure there's some partners from Spurwink who are on the call today, but um, really happy to have some initial data as it relates to the first year of implementation for the Crisis Receiving Center, which, as I mentioned, is designed to provide low barrier access, um, eight private rooms. They have already successfully served over 600 individuals uh, since they've opened over 5,000 visits in the first year. Um, and 85% of individuals who are seen at the Crisis Receiving Center um, are able to have their needs met within 10 visits or less. I think thus indicating how important these low barrier um, programs are. 15% uh, of the folks that are served are transition age youth and 73% are between the ages of 26 and 55. Um, so again, just to ground ourselves in some of the great work that is already underway. And I think our efforts here specifically to continue to advance our mobile crisis teams across the state and to develop the payment model that will support sustainability um, is so important. And I think I am going to turn it over to Kylie. So thank you, Kylie. Hey, everyone. Um, so now we're going to talk about the qualifying community-based mobile crisis intervention. Uh, but before I jump in, I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Um, uh, so many of the folks on this call have been instrumental in this work from, um, you know, endless uh, meetings and welcoming me to visit you at your places of business, um, telling me the stories of the challenges that you're facing in the, the community and the field, folks who have reached out and talked to me about their personal experiences with the crisis system. Um, it is so important that we hear from you and it's so valuable to, uh, to continue to have these conversations. So I just wanna pause for a moment and just say thank you um, before diving in. But uh, just to reorient folks, we got a, a mobile crisis planning grant from the Center for Medicaid and Med Medicare Services. Uh, we started our work in uh, the end of 2021, but really 2022, we began in earnest. This slide should look familiar to folks. Um, this is uh, the Qualifying Community-Based Mobile Crisis Intervention Service as outlined by uh, the federal guidance. Um, and so they, the um, America Rescue Plan defined this uh, as part of the grant. And what we've been trying to do is crosswalk our current mobile crisis intervention services with the national best practices and figure out where those points were that um, were pain points in our current system or where we had gaps um, and make some goals to get to our, our national best practice and federal guidance level qualifying care. Um, so one of the things that we talked about first um, during one of our 988 planning um, committee meetings was that their federal authority does allow DHHS to waive the any willing and qualified provider requirement through our state plan amendment. Um, and DHHS proposes that they be, these services be eligible only for um, the competitively selected providers with the OBH and OCFS contracts. Uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, that the regionalization of services is essential to make sure that folks have access, uh, timely access um, to this care. So a high level overview of our service starts with member eligibility. Uh, there are a few changes here. So um, first, uh, individuals must meet the financial eligibility criteria, but something that's a little different is that um, only after the individual is stabilized is it the responsibility to determine eligibility for main care. And this service, uh, something that was highlighted early on is that this is to respond to both mental health and substance use crises, not simply mental health crises with co-occurring substance use disorder, um, does not require formal diagnosis. So some of the highlighted provider requirements. Um, qualifying mobile crisis teams may include, um, so we were really thoughtful when we were looking at the certification levels for the various members of the team. Um, and in the CMS guidance, they do want a, a team of more than one person to go out to respond to a crisis. Um, the team must comprise somebody who has uh, eligibility to perform an assessment. And so those are the folks that you'll see highlighted in purple. And then other qualified staff um, can be a member of the team. 
I do want to note also that co-response with law enforcement is um, does count as a team-based response, but we uh, would prefer that folks be going out in a team made up of this uh, someone who can do an assessment and another qualified staff. Um, so we worked with a cross office, I mean, cross office uh, interdisciplinary team to determine the best way to build a team that would be able to respond to a complex uh, case or children versus adults, people with developmental disabilities, people who have substance use disorder. So there are numerous professionals who are outlined here because we, your team makeup might vary depending on the individual's needs. I'm happy to take questions about that. If you want to put those in the chat, we'll answer those as we're able. Um, so there's certain training areas that uh, teams must be trained in um, in order to qualify for this uh, service. And that would be the uh, general DHHS crisis response training, which is inclusive of suicide prevention and su zero suicide. Trauma-informed care is essential, harm reduction, cultural affirmation, de-escalation, and um, appropriate response for people with co-occurring mental health and intellectual disabilities. Um, we're asking that folks be uh, trained in the START model, which stands for Systemic Therapeutic Assessment, Resources, and Treatment, and it's evidence-informed, person-centered, solution-focused approach. Um, as folks on this call may or may not know, we do have a um, specific crisis service for disability crisis. However, folks who have disabilities may not be eligible for that service, so they may get routed to the, um, the regular uh, crisis system, and we want to make sure that folks know how to connect people to the appropriate service or to uh, respond to somebody who may have an intellectual disability but may not be eligible for aging and disability services. Um, I think a lot of folks on this call are familiar with trauma-informed care. It's an understanding of psychological trauma, symptoms, and feelings associated with uh, trauma and traumatizing relationships. These relationships can be indivi with re individuals or systems um, and providing physical and emotional safety, uh, making sure that we maximize the individual's choice and control and ensure a collaborative relationship, uh, sharing power and maximizing empowerment and skill building. Um, we should also consider that um, all members potentially have trauma and uh, we should seek to limit re-traumatization. So if folks have um, had a negative experience with a, a care system in the past, just being mindful of that and, and trying to meet that person where they are. Harm reduction also is a requirement um, in the CMS guidance, and harm reduction is most commonly associated with substance use, but harm reduction philosophy can be used for individuals exhibiting any high-risk behavior. There's a lot of um, work being done right now about harm reduction in suicidology, um, so the department will assist with uh, providing training opportunities for harm reduction. It really is a philosophy of hope and healing. It avoids assumptions and um, it really emphasizing the, emphasizes the use of those with lived experience. Uh, so our model, as you'll see, has the opportunity for peer support workers, family peer support, youth peer support, recovery coaches. That's an essential part of this uh, new service model. Cultural affirmation um, is also really important uh, for all members to be trained in. We need to make sure that it, we recognize the diversity of populations. Um, culture is in, beyond just race and ethnicity. It includes the way that people identify. Um, so we need to also make sure that uh, workers in the field are understanding power issues in the healthcare worker-patient relationship. They're aware of cultural, social, and historical issues in organizations and institutions. And there's special focus on communication. So language, sign language, um, making sure that there's power sharing and decision-making and that we respect um, and recognize fundamental cultural beliefs that may be different from the traditional Western, uh, Western medical model. And so our teams must have the capacity to render culturally affirming response to anyone in need, regardless of co-occurring conditions or the complexity of crisis. So, um, you know, regardless of whether somebody has intellectual disabilities, has language barriers, we need to make sure that we are providing um, culturally affirming response and that we are able to meet the needs 
regardless of what those co-occurring complexities may be. Another piece of this is that um, crisis teams must use the DHHS designated crisis management system. So we are working with open beds uh, the, to develop a specialized main crisis software system. Um, and that is the way that that will work is outlined here in these bubbles. Um, we are excited that we'll have the ability to create a unique identifier for each client. Um, and it will start at the mobile, at uh, the main crisis line or wherever a person presents in crisis. So if they were to present in person somewhere, um, the, uh, someone could open up this crisis software and begin to input their information. And that information can be shared across the crisis care continuum so that the person in crisis doesn't have to continue to retell their story, regardless of which treatment setting they end up in, there will be an ability to read the notes um, regarding that individual. Um, we are going to continue to work on developing that, and we do hope that uh, some of you will be participating in those stakeholder groups as well. So um, we want our services to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and we can have the services delivered in person or via telehealth. Um, they, we also understand that sometimes we not, might not be able to connect directly with the person in crisis, um, uh, that we can provide services to parents or guardians uh, or members impacted by the crisis event. And so our covered services, um, you'll note that engagement is the biggest and it's in the middle. And I think that's important because uh, each crisis is self-defined. In crisis theory, a person is going to tell us what constitutes a crisis in their life. Um, and if someone from the main crisis line or uh, walk-in person connects with a mobile crisis team, we want everyone to receive an engagement. So a connection to the a care provider. Um, and then depending on what that person needs or how they direct that communication, they may need an assessment, intervention, coordination, follow-up, de-escalation. It will be dependent on that person's crisis event. Um, so I won't read everything to you on the slide, but engagement is that strength-based process. Um, it's supposed to be that healing connection and um, that what makes people feel like they are on the path to getting the support that they need. Um, and we know that all of our wonderful crisis providers are capable of developing that therapeutic relationship. Uh, De-escalation, our verbal and nonverbal techniques, um, transferring that sense of calm and unconditional positive regard to a person in crisis. So this will be part of the required training, um, but some folks who might have elevated levels of agitation will need de-escalation. Uh, de-escalation is incredibly important for diversion. We're trying to divert people away from emergency departments or from law enforcement engagement, as Sarah mentioned earlier. And uh, having skillful workers who are trained in de-escalation will be essential for that. It is um, our goal to maintain people in the least restrictive environment and to provide community-based responses whenever possible. So if we are able to um, de-escalate situations and maintain people safely in community, that is the goal. Assessment um, is something that we will have to work to define because I think that the current way that we have our assessments is uh, really thorough, but we need to understand that in a crisis setting, we need enough information to make decisions and work on interventions. Uh, we might have limited information available and getting every detail is uh, going to be not, not the primary goal. And eventually we'll wanna go back and get more details, but how can we assess an individual, determine what their intervention needs might be and understand that we don't wanna delay the assessment for any reason. Um, so if somebody is intoxicated or extremely agitated, what information can we get uh, from the get-go? Can we interview third parties, uh, get other folks who are familiar with the situation? Um, so gathering from all available resources and making sure that we address the most acute issues and then understanding that we may have to reassess at a later date. Intervention must be timely and match the person's identified needs. So intervention is uh, can be safety planning, motivational interviewing, crisis resolution planning, 
um, but providing the person with what they need based on their initial assessment and figuring out what those most acute needs are and addressing those first. Um, so safety planning can also include lethal mean, mean, means safety planning if necessary, determining whether or not that person has um, anything at the home that could cause harm to themselves or others. Um, and crisis resolution planning uh, is essential to assist individuals to respond to their current stressors and then have them identify supports um, to help get to previous baseline status. Coordination and follow-up. Um, so some folks might just need coordination and follow-up. Uh, any provider can make a referral to a crisis providing agency for stabilization services without prior authorization. Um, the duration uh, and the service level will be dependent on the individualized crisis plan, um, and that will end with a warm handoff to another provider. So this is a really uh, trying to formalize in our new policy, the crisis aftercare pilot that OCFS um, started and has had great success with, and understanding that um, if we're able to help somebody to reduce the likelihood of decompensation or to stabilize after being released from a more restrictive care level um, that we can prevent future crisis events. So um, we want to make sure that people have that warm handoff regardless of whether they're, they're discharging from somewhere or they have a community provider who is concerned about um, their ability to maintain in the community. We wanna make sure that there's good connection between providers and that folks are feeling supported uh, until they have other support set up. Um, other important proposals is that we are looking to include uh, reimbursement for non-medical and non-emergency transportation after stabilization. Um, we have expectations and we're gonna clarify those around medical screening and clearance and other protocols and that um, we're going to include performance-based payment provision. Uh, these measures will be decided uh, at a future date. That's it for me. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure you have questions and I'm happy to check the chat as uh, Burns and Associates takes it over from here. Thanks, Kylie. That was excellent. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll let you answer the questions in the chat um, and people can put more in there as, as they go through. And I think what we wanted to start again with the with Sarah and Kylie's presentation, because I think as you're processing that and we go into this conversation with Stephen um, around how are we gonna pay for this? What's the best way to pay for this? Um, there are some key questions that we have um, as we move to something that's new and different the way that we set rates has to be different because we're talking about a future state versus just an update of the current state. So some of your questions may come up um, in the next section and you can still put those in the chat. And again, we're not presenting um, a solution today. So it's really a great opportunity for some more discussion around the next steps for how we're gonna get to a sustainable reimbursement model for this new and improved service model. So I'll turn to hand it over to Steven. Great, thank you, Olivia, and good afternoon, everybody. I think I know many people on the call, but I'll just spend a moment or two on introductions. I am Stephen Plowski. I'm with the Burns and Associates Division of Health Management Associates. We're a consultant working with Main Care and, and the department more generally on provider reimbursement. We've done quite a few rate studies with Main Care over the years, including a recent one that covered uh, the majority of other services covered through sections 65, 13, 17, 28, and 92 of the Main Care Benefits Manual. So happy to spend a little bit of time with you walking through what we see as the next steps on helping think through a reimbursement model for crisis services. And in a few minutes, I'll share my screen and walk through a initial draft of a provider survey we're looking to get feedback on. Um, there might be a few minutes today for that feedback, but we'll be sending it out to the group um, if not today, then on Monday, uh, and give you a, a week or so to provide your input about what you think we might also need to be inquiring about to make sure we have an understanding of how services are delivered today, noting, of course, the point that Olivia just made, that services might look different, and in fact, not might, will look different tomorrow. So we, we certainly are being thoughtful about the adjustments that we'll have to make to account for practice changes. I just want to reiterate a point or two that have been raised in earlier remarks on uh, as part of this meeting. And that's 
first, that we've not landed on any specific recommendations around payments. And certainly that applies to rates themselves or payment levels, but also even to payment methodologies. So folks understand, of course, today how providers are paid through a fee-for-service model through main care and that's supplemented with contract funds. Uh, and I'm not saying that that will change, but at least we're keeping an open mind about other potential approaches to reimbursing for services. So as we're thinking through our conversations with you and our provider survey, we want to maintain that flexibility because those decisions have, have not yet been made. To that end, it could also potentially be that we'll think about a multi-phase implementation approach that it might make sense to look at reimbursement through one model for a period of time and then transition to a different model. As I think Olivia mentioned, or perhaps it was Kylie a moment ago talking about um, pay for performance models. So there's a, a number of things that obviously remain to be decided and we wanna maintain that flexibility and recognize that, that we're talking about both practice changes and potentially reimbursement changes. One of the other things that we're going to be thoughtful regarding is the payment responsibility from a state perspective. So obviously, main care has a large role in reimbursing for crisis services because so many folks are insured through main care, but they're not not everyone who gets supports are, are covered through main care, and we can't allocate costs for non-main care recipients to a, a Medicaid funded program. So we need to think about how best to accommodate that as well. So all that's to say that there's a lot of moving pieces, but our fundamental goal, at least, is to ensure that we're building a reimbursement model that supports providers in delivering services consistent with what the state's expectations are, which is what Kylie just spent a few minutes walking through at a high level. So making sure that we're supporting the capacity that is necessary to deliver 24-hour coverage, to deliver two-person responses, to ensure the um, culturally competent responses that, that were alluded to. So that's my kind of long-winded way of, of saying that we don't have all the answers here today, but we'll be working on this uh, on a fairly expedited basis to come up with a model that we think hits all of these, these goals that we have in mind. So as I said, what I wanted to spend the uh, majority of my time talking about here during the meeting, and, and I, don't, I won't take a lot of time, it is uh, an overview of the survey that we've put together. Again, it's draft. We want to hear from you about what else you think we might need to learn. And again, uh, I'll emphasize a point that I've already made once and that Olivia just made that the survey is, is backwards looking and certainly will be cognizant of the fact that service requirements are going to be changing on a going forward basis. So if you will bear with me for just a moment, I have to wade through a number of open windows to find this survey. And I know many of you have been through many of these surveys with my team and I in the past. So a lot of this is going to look relatively familiar to you. As again, folks will be familiar with already, our surveys are in Microsoft Excel format um, to support fairly easy data entry. One thing that you're going to notice pretty quickly as I start to walk through this is that We've tried to streamline this to the greatest degree that we could. And in particular, what you're not gonna find in this survey, which is a departure from what you will have seen in our previous surveys, is all the cost schedules that we typically include. And we've omitted those for a couple of reasons, primarily, or I should say not primarily, because we have, we think the information we need from other sources to inform the, the cost side of things. So. We, of course, have the budgets that each provider submits to the department that is the basis for reimbursement um, through the contracts. And, and as folks are also, I think, aware, we recently completed that behavioral health and targeted case management rate study. So we got a wealth of information through that means as well to inform things like benefit packages and typical salaries by position and the like. So we, you won't see those schedules included in this particular survey. Instead, what we're focusing on is who it is you're providing services to, and that goes to the point I made a moment ago about in understanding the, the various mix of individuals who you care for, not just people enrolled in main care, who works in the program, because as all providers can attest, that's going to be the primary cost driver, and what the staff who work in the program do. So at the highest of high levels, those are the, the couple three things that we're trying to 
gathered through this particular survey, again, to reflect current service delivery, recognizing, as I've said now for a third or fourth time, that we'll be having to be layering on top of that changes to practices as Kylie has summarized. And so with that, I'm just gonna walk through the three forms that we have within the survey itself, and I'll endeavor to make these larger as, I, larger as I'm walking through. The top part is what we always ask about, that's just to whom we can contact with any questions that we might have. And, and I perhaps am taking it for granted that everybody has been through these surveys with us before. So let me just take a half step backwards and, and provide a, a quick overview of our approach. So we'll be, after we finalize the survey based upon feedback from service providers, we'll be sending this out for completion using the contact information that we have on file. So all current crisis providers will be asked to complete this survey. Um, we'll provide technical assistance on an as needed basis. Um, Carl Matzinger, who many of you have worked with on our recent project for behavioral health and targeted case management services will be the primary point of contact on this. Um, and folks will have probably three, four weeks to complete the survey and submit it to us. We'll conduct a desk review. And if there's any questions that we have about what's been submitted, we'll follow up with you on those questions. The other thing that we're gonna do for this particular engagement, which we don't always have the luxury of being able to do, is schedule follow-up meetings with each current provider. And we think that's gonna be particularly important for this project so that we have a true appreciation for how these programs are operated. Obviously, one of the things that distinguishes crisis services from any other services is that, that need for uh, paying for capacity to deliver services when those crises occur. We can't schedule crises. So um, we want to recognize that, that that's a, a burden is not the right word, but a requirement of the service. And, and we want to leave some space for us to have conversations on a provider by provider basis to talk through how you're serving your catchment areas, what the challenges you're facing are, how you'd like to see reimbursement approved. So we're going to do that, schedule those for after the survey period, because we want to have the surveys in hand in case we have any questions, and we'll be um, scheduling those uh, or reaching out to you probably in a couple of weeks from now, once we have a clear sense of the deadline for the survey. So the bottom part of this form is asking for payment information. And in this case, we are limiting this to payments that that support crisis resolution, which is the, the main care label. Um, mobile crisis is really what we're getting at um, from a variety of different sources. And obviously, there's the fee for service that everyone's familiar with paid through main care. There's other HHA, DHHS funding contracts with, with ODH. Um, other private insurance might be paying for some crisis services for people who are enrolled in those programs, like Medicare or the Veteran uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, any private insurance or self-pay. Again, not necessarily expecting a lot of that, but, but that um, certainly has potential. The idea here is, as I've said, we want to be comprehensive in understanding the overall crisis system, and, and we want to recognize that there are other parties involved outside of main care or outside of even the entire department. So that's that's what we're trying to get at here from a revenue perspective. You'll also see on the subsequent slide, excuse me, subsequent spreadsheet um, questions about who is receiving services. From here, we have just two more forms that re relate to service delivery. The first is asking information on an office by office basis. Again, understanding what the staffing currently looks like and then ultimately translating that to the, um, in comparison to the level of support that's being delivered out each of those offices. And then the second form relates to staffing specific questions. So things that all of, most of the providers on this call are gonna be familiar with because it's a familiar, it's a comparable to what we've done in previous surveys where we're asking for what we call productivity or, or how folks spend their work weeks. So this first form, as I said, is now gigantic more gigantic than I had hoped, um, is asking for information on an office by office basis, recognizing that you might have a physical space, uh, more than one physical space. Um, I'll probably streamline this. I don't think we'll need the address information, but uh, a city and zip code, um, just wanting to understand the, the kind of areas of, of um, service delivery, um, where people are being deployed from, so we can do some analysis about the kind of geographic um, capacity across the state. Then the 
the next section just relates to staffing. And we'll update this using the same list that you saw in Kylie's presentation in terms of the classification for workers. The only two that we have listed at the moment are MHRTs and, and licensed social workers of a variety of different types. But we'll make sure we include information that you can report peers and, and those other job titles that you saw on her slide. And so what we're looking for here is nothing more complicated than the number of hours scheduled by staff type within each of these physical offices. We're, even after we add the additional job titles, we'll have this open-ended section that in, allows you to report other job titles, or other, I should say, employee classifications more accurately um, that are uh, providing support out of that particular office. The next section relates to caseload and coverage or insurance coverage types. So we wanna know the number of people to whom you delivered crisis resolution services in the past year. And then from there on lines 11 through 14, it's talking about the insurance that they have. So main care, other public, private, and those who are uninsured. We understand that there's also the concept that not everyone who has insurance, uh, other insurance will pay for these services, which is why we have the revenue question on the first form. On this form, we really are just focused about what their coverage rates are because we are gonna have to, as I said, think about cost allocation for this particular project to make sure that Medicaid's paying the share that's attributed to Medicaid, but then recognizing that there will likely be other gaps that the department is gonna have to fill in um, to, to meet the needs of other people who are not enrolled in main care. So that's how we're thinking about the first page about revenues, where the money is coming from, which is different from what insurance people have, because we know not everybody is paying for these services or not paying um, comparably for these services. And then we have just a handful of questions that we label service details that talks about where services are provided and the typical length of an encounter because that informs things like the, the level of staffing that is necessary, what we refer to as productivity. So on line 15 and 16, it's a fairly straightforward split between whether or not services are being provided in an ED um, versus another setting. We're curious as to whether or not the typical encounter looks different based upon setting. So you'll see on line 17 and 18, we're asking for the typical length of that service encounter. So when someone has made contact with an individual, how long are they providing supports to that individual, um, both in a hospital emergency department setting, as well as other community settings. Asking about the current state of affairs in terms of the percentage of responses that include two staff members, understanding that that's likely to be an additional cost um, given the uh, forthcoming requirement for there to be two staff members on, on hopefully all responses. And then a question about mileage. So for the staff in that office, how many miles do they travel as part of the work that they're doing related to mobile crisis or crisis resolution services? The final form that we have, again, so folks will understand this is a lot shorter than our typical survey, is asking for information on an employee by employee basis. And we think that's feasible here, um, having taken a look at the budgets that uh, agencies have because um, programs typically aren't employing dozens and dozens of individuals within their, their crisis program. And so we're hoping that this allows for uh, a high degree of thoughtfulness related to how each individual staff person spends their time as part of their work delivering mobile crisis or crisis resolution services. So on line number one, we're asking for an employee name or ID. We'll make clear that we really don't, it doesn't need to be anything official, as long as if we have questions, you can type back. So if you want to label people one through 10 or whatever, that's fine, as long as you know, if we ask questions about person number three, you know who person number three was when you were completing the survey. We want to know their licensing or certification. That's a drop down list. Uh, again, we'll review the list to make sure that we're being comprehensive with the, the people that we need to include. From here, because there's um, a little bit of ambiguity in the budgets that are submitted, we're asking for the number of hours that someone works or worked, I should say, in the reported fiscal year versus the number of hours that were attributed to the mobile crisis function. And the, re the distinction that we're drawing here is when we look at those budgets, we're seeing what's pretty apparent that folks are not dedicated full time to the crisis program, which is, which is fine. There, that, there's obviously no requirement that that be true, but we wanna understand the, the, um, the 
total hours that the staff people are working and then the hours that are specifically attributable or allocated to the crisis resolution services. Because uh, on those budgets, at least my recollection is that we just see the hours attributed to crisis and it's unclear if this is a part-time worker or full-time worker who's not dedicated full-time to the crisis program. One thing that we're um, interested in understanding on line number six is of the hours reported on line number five, five. So in my example, this person worked 520 hours within the crisis program specifically, how many hours were billable to any payer within that reported fiscal year? And in the flower message, we're talking about that includes main care or other um, insurers like private insurance or, or Medicare as an example, um, but it would not include the, the contract funding in that. So again, we're, we're just trying to drill down a little bit and understanding the, the current moving pieces within the system of, of how you are being paid for services so we can make sure that we're leveraging federal funds as appropriate, but also recognizing that there is a role for other payers, both from a state perspective and from a non-state perspective. Um, and then just understanding for those staff who are not dedicated full-time to crisis resolution services or mobile crisis services, what else they're, they're doing. So it could be that they're providing other services like community integration um, under section 17, or it could be that they're providing administrative support for another program. Perhaps they're a program manager, um, and a portion of their time is associated with crisis services, but a portion of their time is associated with other behavioral health services operated by your agency. And then the last section is what folks who've done one of our surveys before will be familiar with, and that's that productivity or, per, or staffing pattern section where we're saying, or asking, I should say, how many hours do folks work in a typical week? And then how do they spend their time? Certainly, we're looking for your feedback on all elements of this survey, but I would say I am perhaps most particularly interested in this section. It really is important for us to understand how folks are spending their time, particularly given the point that I've made a couple of times already, in which all of you can attest to to a much greater degree than I can, which is there is uh, a, the need for capacity so that we're recognizing that that folks may not be spending the majority of their time providing billable services. I don't know if that's true or not, but we want to make sure that we're really understanding the, the various responsibilities that folks have, both from a, a billing perspective or billable perspective, as well as from a non-billable billable perspective. So we've included things like community outreach activities, you know, presentations in school, um, providing community education, training law enforcement on, on how best to serve people who are in a crisis, as an example. But there well could be, and I suspect there are probably other things that are a regular part of folks' jobs, which we've not included in, in our list. And it's always best to include that on the front end. We include sections down here at the bottom where you can type in other activities, but it's great to have them initially so that there's consistency in reporting across providers rather than us having to try to code what gets reported down here, which we'll do. I'm not gonna suggest that we're not gonna do that, we will. But again, to, to maximize consistency where folks are thinking about those activities, it really, we wanna, draw your attention to this section to make sure that we're not omitting any significant portions of folks' work-related responsibilities. And that's it on this particular survey. Again, I'm happy to, to take questions. I, I think um, Olivia asked you to put those in the chat so we can take a look at those. I, I think after I turn it back, there's probably gonna be time for uh, an open question and answer period, but this is not your only opportunity. As I said, we'll be sending this survey out today or uh, on Monday of next week and giving you a week or so to provide feedback to us. So socialize it with your internal teams, the people who will be responsible for reporting this information. But really the, the fundamental goal here is understanding what goes into managing, operating these programs. So not so much on a cost basis for this particular survey, but have we asked the questions that we need to be asking to understand how it is you're staffing and operating these programs. And, and I'll just reiterate one last point that I already made, which is um, we'll be then following up with everybody to schedule time to walk through the survey generally, but more specifically, just talking about your programs and, and how things are working, where there's opportunities for improvement, just your general thoughts about both service uh, operations as well as um, reimbursement for services. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I I think I'll hand you some questions, but start start by an overarching observation of the questions. Um, is that hopefully it's it's clear the department the proposed policy includes as part of a crisis event, which is not a single event, but a, a set of events, 
or services, I should say, we're including more into what's reimbursable under main care. It's a, it's a from the initial intervention all the way through coordination and follow up. Um, we were defining all aspects of the services responding to a, to that originate from a crisis event. Um, what this survey I think it is trying to do, and what some of these questions are about, is to th therefore taking a broader look at what is happening currently regarding costs that are not currently main care reimbursable or billable, just as the one limited crisis resolution uh, service that exists today. So we are looking, um, we are asking you questions about your current costs and your current staff staffing models and things, but we're asking them in the context of broadening the definition of what would be a main care covered service so that we can incorporate additional things into the new rate. Uh, we are trying to build in the firehouse model of care where in order to deliver the levels of care that the DHHS is expecting, we will have to be putting different productivity assess assumptions or other adjustments into the rate to ensure that that level of service can be provided with the caveats of still needing to think about appropriate main care share um, of co cost coverage versus other sources of revenue that might be factoring into a person's time or an organization's revenue. Um, the only other thing I'll say before some specific questions is um, as we look back at, at, and this data is all, you know, what are you doing now? How is it working now? We will have to make assumptions about what's gonna change going forward. We can't ask you all to give us your assumptions at this point. Uh, the, we will be taking the current information, processing it, and then presenting back the assumptions we're making about what will change for the new reimbursement model. So that's why today we're talking kind of about current state, but then what you'll hear from us in the future is about how are we gonna transition information from the current state into assumptions to build a rate for the future state. Um, so Stephen, I'll hand it back to you if you wanna say anything broader on that point. Otherwise, I think we can go through some questions on the chat. Sorry, I didn't get to my mute button very quickly. Um, I think you did a, a great job summarizing it. And the other thing I'll add, which is what I opened with, is we are also just thinking about the, the broader concept of, of what the reimbursement model could look like and, and wanting to ensure that we have flexibility because that decision has not been made. So, um, for example, Livia just talked about productivity. The productivity is applicable to one sort of reimbursement model. There's other reimbursement models where productivity is a, is a lesser concern. So we want to understand that recognizing that that if we maintain a current approach, productivity is going to be pretty key. Um, but if there is uh, a change to how providers are reimbursed, it, it might look a little bit different. So we are we are trying to think about the various options that we will be considering in, in developing data collection that allows us to, to go a number of different directions based upon those final decisions that, that have yet to be made. Yeah, just to be really concrete about that, because I guess we're all saying things very generally, is for example, if we were going to pay a per episode rate or a per diem rate or a, or a per month per member per rate or a bundled rate, those are the other types of options to get to Mallory's question beyond fee for service that, again, are all under review. Uh, we'll be able to um, think about those options better after Burns has this next round of data collection and conversation with providers. Um, but again, we'll come back to the group with a recommendation around, with all this information, um, what, what reimbursement methodology do we think will work best to meet the goals? And then, um, and then continue on to, and what's the dollar amount associated with that methodology? Um, we'll follow the public process on that as well. Stephen, can you uh, stop sharing your screen during the Q&A, please, so that we can see each other's pretty faces or little black boxes? Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then I also just wanted to say, um, you know, in, in the crisis and contract terms, uh, a lot of what we're asking for here would be what's being uh, built under ancillary. So, uh, you know, we, uh, in typical rate studies, maybe wouldn't capture that. And I think that that's incredibly important. And we've talked a lot about that in our smaller group meetings of those, those things that are being covered in the contract that are not covered by the current fee-for-service rate model, we want to be able to encapsulate that and capture that, as well as plan for a future with these additional requirements, um, thinking about, you know, uh, making assumptions. But also, we, we have some information based on, you know, invoices and the contracting, and we'll, we can share that internally with 
um, with the HMA Burns team, but I think that it's just a bit of a deeper dive into what, what's happening on the ancillary side of things um, and being able to make sure that we value that um, and, and, and get Medicaid reimbursement for it. Yeah, and, and that's exactly, so Burns has, has reviewed we so to answer Dale's question, we've been looking comprehensively at DHHS reimbursement for crisis services, including what providers are billing under their grant funding, um, their grant funding from Office of Behavioral Health or Office of Child and Family Services, to understand again what parts could be med Medicaid reimbursable that are not currently, um, and this also allows us to limit what additionally we needed to ask you for in this survey that Burns presented because you all have been providing providers have been submitting information. Um, in other pathways uh, to the department regarding their crisis models. So we are using all those sources. Um, we have been using those sources and that's how we've kind of landed on the questions that remain that Stephen presented today is things that we wanna make sure, um, as, as Stephen said, we're listening to what you're saying, what, we're understanding what the model is out there and the challenges um, in those conversations with you so that we can um, use that to make the best recommendation. Stephen, do you want to answer Michelle's question about um, figures to be calculated that are not typically measured or tracked? And Michelle, I don't know if you're are you asking might be my my thought is maybe you're asking about like the time, the the, the duration of the crisis episode. Well, I think just some of those items, and I have to, I would have to like sit down with the survey to know which, but I know it came up the last time it came around that like some of those items aren't necessarily broken down into exact numbers, um, whether it's like transportation time or community outreach time or whatever. I think it's hard to give you a, a like really perfect picture of that. So I didn't know how much you all had thought about the importance of how exact those numbers are. So we always acknowledge that for some sections of the survey, we're going to be relying upon your informed understanding of, of the operations of your programs. And, and typically, we think folks have a pretty good handle on those questions. Um, before I move on to options, we'll always say if there's something that you feel that you cannot provide a, a reasonable uh, uh, set of, of approximations or estimations on, then, then you can skip a question in the survey. We don't, we certainly, ideally, particularly with a small number of providers, are hoping that that's not commonplace. And so because there's a, a limited number of, relatively limited number of staff, I mean, I, I think an option would be to, to work with directly with your staff. I mean, I, I suspect they have a, a, you know, not to the minute, but I, they probably have a pretty good sense of how it is they spend their time. Um, you could do something because the survey is going to be out for three or four weeks. You could do a time study um, with your staff for a, a week or two weeks and ask them to, to record how they're spending their time. And as long as there's nothing that makes that week, you think, not representative of what a typical week looks like, that would be, I think, a, a reasonable approach as well. So I, I think there's a number of different ways to get at it. And with, with the, the acknowledgement that we know that there is going to be some degree of of informed judgment employed, and, and that's expected and encouraged. Um, but we, we think that our historically providers have been able to do a pretty good job of it. If you certainly, if you think you just cannot provide that information, then, then you can skip a particular section of the survey. That's helpful, thank you. Does anyone else feel like they're question in the chat wasn't answered. We sort of peppered in a response to a few of them here, but um, anyone want to vocalize any additional questions from the chat or add anything? Or just, again, if you just want to repeat your comments, you're welcome to do that as well if you just want to make a pitch or point. I just think it's worth mentioning for folks who maybe didn't go back in the chat, um, Sarah Wright had a wonderful question about um, the folks that I outlined on the on the mobile crisis uh, 
response team, and that wasn't inclusive of a, a psychiatrist or a, a psych NP. Um, that doesn't. We I was mostly focused on. I was solely focused on who would who's eligible to respond to a crisis, but that doesn't preclude those other folks from being part of the mobile crisis service team. It's just that we wouldn't have the expectation that you would have someone of that level going out into the uh, community. Um, so there's opportunity for feedback. And, and I think I saw on the provider survey a place to outline the, the different members of your team. Um, and the, you know, um, I appreciate the value of that question. And I just wanted to highlight the differential there that it was just who would respond, not who comprises a mobile crisis service team as a whole. Great. Um, and then one other piece that I think gets to some of the questions or Mallory Shaughnessy's comment about the fee-for-service model versus other models, which we've talked about. Um, another piece I think it's important to mention is nationally, there's a bunch of states in the same place we are developing coverage and reimbursement policy for this exact qualifying mobile crisis service. And there, um, you know, Kylie, and I participate in many of these national calls and a lot of states is, really are doing this concurrently with us, planning their models to be released this summer and this fall. So just, a lot, just with us and we'll be monitoring and learning from them um, and how they're paying for these services too. Um, but again, if you start to, there'll be more, more national learnings around payment models for this, but Maine likely we'll need to figure it out ourselves first for what we wanna do um, and what we think's best. Um, because again, we are trying to move this along quickly. Um, which gets me to my next point. Um, I think we'll just go over some quick next steps um, and then we'll pause one more time for questions. The immediate next steps are that Burns and Associates will be sending out draft, the, the tool, the draft survey tool for some feedback, quick feedback, I think about a week or so from existing contracted um, mobile crisis providers. They will finalize the survey tool and then they will release the tool for actual data collection amongst those contracted providers. During that time frame, uh, they will also schedule, seek to schedule one-on-one -on -one conversations with those providers to again provide more context. It's, it's a benefit of this service model in that there's not hundreds of providers, there's just a, um, a few and that we can really listen to, to you and your concerns and your thoughts on this one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And then uh, the department will hold another public meeting where we actually present our reimbursement model and um, perhaps concurrently the actual dollar amount associated with that we'll, we'll see um, with all the assumptions that we use to translate um, current data into future um, the future model and what that would what that would cost or what that um, reimbursement would be. After that, um, the department would open up a public comment period, just as we always do with the rates as of recent um, oper opportunity for public comment before finalizing responding to those comments. For this service, um, there will be a full uh, rulemaking before they, the service actually becomes um, op live, operational in Maine. So additionally, there will be the uh, rulemaking process and rulemaking public comment period to um, look at everything comprehensively and provide additional comments during that process. So all that to be said, we really appreciate your time. There will be more conversation to come. And um, if you have thoughts, and um, or have thoughts, then reach out to anyone on the team from DHHS and we'll be able to get back to you. Um, to the comments in the chat. Okay, good. Mallory, I'm glad to hear that your feedback on that we should present both the rate and the, and the model, reimbursement model at the same time um, before asking for comment. That sounds good. 
Um, and then our goal for when this whole thing will be will be operationalized and live and uh, effective within Maine is um, October 2023 this year is what we're going for. But we'll keep you updated on anything that impacts that time frame. And folks can feel free to reach out to me with any questions, comments, concerns, feedback. We'll send you the PowerPoint. If you don't have my contact information already, I will put it in the chat, but I'm happy to liaise between um, the department and provider community public. Um, I'm always happy to hear from people because it does it inform the work so much. So please don't hesitate. If you have a thought, put it in, a, in an email and send it my way. Thank you. And we'll be um, sending out a um, email notifying you of the posting of these materials on the department website as well. All right. Um, any closing remarks from anyone on the call before we end a little bit early? Okay. Thank you all so much for this um, really important work. We're really going to be making, I think, a big step forward here. So very appreciative of your engagement um, and have a great rest of your Friday. Thank you. Bye.